Hello everyone, this is lecture 1 for the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. Myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar, I am Associate Professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Guwahati. In this particular course, we will be discussing primarily about the structure of the earth in terms of uh, earthquake occurrence and induced damages, why earthquakes are happening and the factors which are responsible as far as earthquake and induced damages are concerned. Whenever we are discussing about earthquakes, the primary concern which comes to our mind is what is happening beneath the earth's surface which is leading to the occurrence of earthquake. Lecture 1 in this particular course will be focusing more about the structure of the earth both in terms of composition as well as physical characteristics and then we will be also discussing about because of variation in significant properties of the material beneath the ground surface and up to the center of the earth, what is leading to different processes happening at the surface of the earth and the movement which is finally leading to building up of stresses and release of these stresses in terms of earthquakes from time to time. We will come back to the stresses release as well as building up of strain energy from time to time which is leading to earthquakes once again in subsequent lectures. In today's lecture, we will be focusing more on plate tectonics, continental drift theory. So, these two uh, terms that is plate tectonics and continental drift theory will primarily help in understanding the physical phenomena which are happening all across the globe. So, let us talk about the internal structure of the earth. The geosphere as a general term we talk about when we are discussing about the rocks which are present in the earth and different materials, minerals which are also present in the earth. Earth is further we can categorize into various layers depending upon if we are looking from composition point of view or we are looking from physical properties of the earth. When we are discussing about different layers that means we are starting from the surface because we live at the surface, we are aware about the soil type, the rock types, physical properties, chemical properties of the material primarily available on the earth surface. But in order to understand the, the various features which are happening across the globe, we have to also understand what is available beneath the surface of the earth and what is composed if you reach towards the center of the earth, what are the different layers what is the physical composition of these layers, chemical composition of these layers, is there any mechanism which is defining the current position and current response of these layers that we will be discussing about. So, based on the composition, the earth can be divided primarily into three layers. The first one is crust. Crust is basically the layer which we, we are staying whenever it, we are talking about the mass of land available on the continent which is not submerged, we call it as continental crust and generally the crust, we are having similar layer of the crust even below the ocean. So, that particular layer is called as oceanic crust. As you move from the surface and reach to the bottom of the crust because it is a thin layer on which we, 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 we are staying or explorations are mainly also focused on the crustal medium. Then once you start moving from the crust we encounter another material because of change in the composition of the material by which a particular layer is formed that layer is called as mantle. So, again the mantle will be starting from the depth of the crust or the bottom of the crust and it will be extending up to significant thickness as you start moving from the surface of the earth towards the center of the earth. Once the mantle is uh, completing the thickness you will encounter another layer which is significant change in the composition that layer is called as core. So, so, in terms of composition primarily we can say the entire earth is consisting of three layers that is crust that is the topmost layer on the surface of the earth. If you move to downward then you will encounter another layer with significant change in the composition that is called as mantle and the third layer which is located beneath the mantle that is called as the core. Again based on physical properties, we can further divide the earth into 5 layers. 
So, the first one was based on composition, the second one is based on physical properties. Based on physical properties, we can decide that there can be lithosphere, there can be asthenosphere, mesosphere and then outer core and inner core. So, while one side based on the composition, the earth was divided into three layers in terms of physical properties, the material, strength as well as the physical characteristic in which the medium is available, we can divide the entire earth into five layers that is lithosphere, asthenosphere, mesosphere, outer core as well as inner core. Now, one question which comes to our mind is on what basis we are thinking like earth is not having the same characteristics throughout its thickness as we are seeing on the surface of the earth. That means, if you start moving across the globe, you will find out somewhere rocks, somewhere weathered rocks, somewhere soil, somewhere some mineral deposition will also be encountered. And generally we see there is some limitation in terms of the density of the material. If, if you talk about the maximum density which is available on the surface of the earth, usually you will find rocks of the density lesser than 3 gram per cc. Similarly, the density of water, we, are, we, we encounter water on the surface, water density is also 1 gram per cc. However, if we start looking at the overall density of the earth, you will come to know that the overall density of the earth is somewhere like 5.5 gram per cc. So, this figure itself gives you an indication that we do not have complete information about the material available beneath the earth if we only take into account the densities of the material which are actually visible on the earth surface. Because the density of the material available on the earth surface is of the order of 2.8, 2.93 gram per cc. However, the overall density of the earth is above 5.5 gram per cc. So, certainly this is indicating firstly that even heavier materials are available on the earth. We do not know whether it is near the surface or at deeper depths. Secondly, because the overall density of the so rock, uh, earth is significantly higher than the average density of medium available or generally encountered at the crystal medium that is 3 gram per cc, that is also indicating that the material which is available beneath the earth surface is actually dominating in terms of the overall mass or overall density of the earth. So, that is also indicating that the material which is not directly visible on the surface or on the crust, that material is also available in huge volume that is how it is dominating the overall density of the earth with respect to the density of the material you generally encounter at the ground surface. So, this clearly indicates that there are interior layers on the earth which are generally composed of heavier materials and because the overall density is higher than the material encountered at the crust, we will also see the volume of the material which is available and is belonging to higher densities is also significantly larger in volume in comparison to the medium available on the crystal layers. Now, denser layers generally it is understood that denser layers are available at greater depth, lighter layers are available at near the surface or relatively on shallower depth. Similarly, most dense medium we will come to know most dense medium. So, these mediums are generally located at the center of the earth. Gravity is generally the most driving force which will help in deposition as well as weathering also at times in terms of weathering and deposition and sedimentation of different material available on the surface of the earth as well as to the deeper layers. Now, here in this particular picture we can see the picture on the uh, left hand side you can see if you see uh, satellite image of the earth you will only see clouds, then you will see land mass and then you will see ocean or the water bodies which are available on the earth as you see from the top. But if you take a cross section of the earth or you take a slice out of it, you will see there is significant variation in terms of material characteristics as well as in terms of the physical properties in which the material exists at or near the surface. The same observation continues as you move towards the center of the earth. The first layer which we were talking about that is the crust, it is generally consisting of thin layers 
if you are talking about continental crust or the land mass which is available uh, at the top surface of the earth, you generally call it as continental crust. Mainly it has been observed that these continental crusts are granitic in layers and the thickness of the crystal medium which is available for the continent, it is of the order of 8 to 40 kilometers. Same way if you go to the ocean, ocean bed there will be oceanic crust. It has been observed that oceanic crust is dominated in basaltic contents and is having thickness of the order of 5 to 8 kilometers. Similarly, below ocean or continental crust that means reaching a depth of 12 meter up to 40, uh, 12 kilometer or up to 40 kilometer, you will encounter another layer that is called as upper mantle. So, it is located below the crust and continues till a depth of 650 kilometer. When I say 650 kilometer, that means the measurement of the depth from the ground surface. So, from the surface, the mantle is continuing up to 650 kilometer and the upper mantle is starting from the bottom of the crust. Similarly, there will be another layer of mantle that is called as lower mantle that will start after a depth of 650 kilometer and will continue till a depth of 2900 kilometer. This particular layer of mantle which is located below the lower mantle, it is called as the, the, the layer which is located below the upper mantle, it is called as lower mantle. Now, once you reach a particular depth of 2900 kilometer, you will again encounter another layer of material which is located below the lower mantle and the thickness or the depth in which the material is continuing is up to 5300 kilometer or on an average you can understand the thickness of outer core itself is almost close to 2900 kilometer. Below the outer core that means once you reach a particular depth of 5300 kilometer you will encounter another layer of material which is called as inner core. So, it inner core is starting from the bottom of the outer core and it continues to a depth of 6400 kilometer or approximately till it reaches the center of the earth. So, you started from the surface, encountered crust depending upon whether it is on land mass, whether it is under water body, you will call it as continental crust or oceanic crust. Then you start moving below the crust you will encounter upper mantle which is continuing till a uh, depth of 650 kilometer. Then followed by that there will be significant change in the material composition. You will see another material which is ranging up to 2900 kilometer depth and the name of the material is or the la layer is lower mantle. Then you will encounter another layer at 2900 kilometer depth which will continue for another 2900 kilometer depth and that is called as outer core. In terms of inner core, the layer is starting from the bottom of outer core and is continuing till a depth of 6400 kilometer from the ground surface. Now, if we see in terms of known information about the earth, generally we try understanding the subsurface medium by using different uh, exploration techniques. Such exploration techniques in terms of soil will be limited to a depth of maybe 50, 100 meter. If you talk about rocks, depending upon your depth of exploration, 2 kilometers, 3 kilometers. But here we are talking about the layers of the earth starting from the surface and reaching till the center of the earth. So, now we can get an understanding about what different layers are available if you start from the surface and reach to the center of the earth. Now, look at let us look at the temperature variation. We see at the surface temperature minus 20, minus 25 degree centigrade to as high as 48, 50, 52 degrees centigrade. That is relatively the temperature you encounter at the ground surface in different part of the globe. Let us see how the variation of the temperature is happening beneath the ground surface. So, another photo which is given on the right hand side of the slide, you can see in the near surface crust as well as upper mantle, you will see the variation in the temperature is in the range of 0 to 3 C. 370 degree centigrade. Again in lower mantle you will see temperature varying from 370 degree centigrade to as high as 3700 degree centigrade. Once you reach outer core again there will be significant jump in the temperature from 3700 degree centigrade to 
40, 300 degree centigrade. Once you reach out inner core, there will be significant jump in the temperature. So, in the inner core, the temperature can reach even up to 7200 degree centigrade. So, one side you, we are having different layers on the soil and at the other side, not the temperature is constant throughout. So, temperature is also significantly jumping. We will encounter as a general understanding, as you go deeper and deeper, there will be increase in temperature as well as there is significant increase in the overburden pressure in which a material at a particular depth is going to withstand. Now, the crust as we discussed about depending upon the position of the crust, if it is on land mass, it is called as the continental crust and then if it is under the ocean, you call it as oceanic crust. The continental crust, it is generally much thicker up to a thickness of 75-80 kilometer and is composed of relatively less dense granitic rocks. The density of such rocks is in the range of 2.7 gram per cc and is strongly deformable. Some of the oldest rocks which are available on the planet belongs to continental crust and at times can have an age of billions of years. Oceanic crust, these are relatively thinner in terms of uh, in, in comparison to continental crust, usually in the range of 8 to 10 kilometer thickness and is mainly composed of basaltic rocks of volcanic origin. Usually these are heavier than continental crust. So, where continental crust was having average density of 2.7 gram per cc, the continental crust on the other hand can have, the, the oceanic crust on the other hand can have a density of higher than that. Comparatively, the oceanic crust are non-deformable and geologically younger usually 200, 300 millions of years of age in comparison to the continental crust which at times you will encounter of billions of years of age. You can see in this particular picture also, so one side you are having a land mass and other side you are having ocean. So, whatever is located beneath the ocean that is a part of oceanic crust and whatever is available on the continent that is a part of oceanic cr continental crust. Now, let us go to the second layer that is the mantle which is existing from below the base of the crust and continues till the top of outer core. As the name suggests or as the position of mantle is, it basically covers the core. The thickness of mantle overall including upper mantle and lower mantle, it is 2900 kilometer thickness and it constitutes of 82 percent of earth's volume. So, depending upon the thickness of mantle and its position which is basically in between the crust as well as the core, we can understand that significant portion of earth's volume as well as earth mass will be dominated by mantle. That is the reason almost 82 percent of entire volume of material on the earth, it is because of mantle. Similarly, if you talk about the mass of the earth, 68 percent of mass of the earth is solely coming from mantle. Again, mantle if you discuss in terms of composition, it consists of rocks primarily made from silica and oxygen. Also, there are iron and magnesium presence in abundance if you talk about the material which is available in mantle. Fragments of mantle are at times brought to the surface during volcanic eruption. So, there are volcanic eruption as a result of which the material which is available in mantle will come on to the surface. We will see what is the uh, governing mechanism in terms of volcanic eruption as well as other uh, features on the surface of the earth in coming slides. So, the material from the mantle will come through volcanic rocks or volcanic eruptions and get settled on the ground surface. Because of the presence of overlying rocks, because as you are moving deeper, one side there is increase in the temperature, on other side there is increase in the overburden pressure. So, you can see here the density increases with depth starting from 3.2 gram per cc in the upper mantle to as high as 5 gram per cc 
to the interface between the mental, lower mental as well as the core. The next layer which comes into picture is the core. So core, it is extending in a diameter of 7000 kilometers. We discuss about the mental which is having a thickness of 2900 kilometer. So after reaching a depth of 2900 kilometer, there will be core starting from 2900 kilometer depth continues to 6400 kilometer depth and then that will continue because it is the center part of the earth. So on an average, the core is extending in a diameter of 7000 kilometers. The density in the core similar to mental also increases with depth. The average density of material available in core is 10.8 gram per cc. In terms of volume, the mental was contributing close to 80 percent of earth's volume, but core though the density is very high, it is only contributing 16 percent of earth's volume. In terms of mass of the earth, we will see that close to 32 percent of the contribution of total mass of the earth is coming from the core itself. When we talk about the core, it is further divided in terms of physical characteristics as well as chemical composition into two layers primarily. That is the first one is outer core which is extending between 2900 kilometer to 5100 kilometer depth. So the outer core which is starting from the base of the mantle at 2900 kilometer depth and will continue till a depth of 5100 kilometer. Usually it is consisting of alloy of iron and nickel with temperature varying from 4000 to 5000 degree centigrade and is usually available in liquid form. This also results in the cause of convection current or generation of convection current. So there is a core, outer core because of variation in the temperature between the top of outer core and the base of the outer core that will lead to development of convection current and being material which is magnetic in nature, when this material is undergoing rotation, you will this particular outer core or movement of material in the outer core will also result in the development of earth's magnetic field. Depending upon the direction of rotation of inner core with respect to the convection current which is generated in the outer core, even the possibility of shifting in the magnetic poles, the configuration of magnetic poles, magnetic north and magnetic south is also a possibility. This leaves a record on the rocks in terms of paleomagnetic values. That means shifting in the magnetic poles or the configuration of magnetic poles whenever there is a shift and when if there is any magnetic material which is undergoing some kind of densifi densification or solidification, usually the magnetic content of that material will align with respect to the north and south magnetic poles available at that particular time. So such understanding or the orientation of the magnetic minerals in those rocks will also help in understanding the movement or in understanding whether the present configuration of the mineral is actually belonging to that particular geographical location or that particular mineral rock deposition has moved from its parent position and has been redeposited somewhere else. So generally in terms of when we are interested to find out movement of the landmass which will come under uh, plate tectonics, so we can get supporting information whenever we start exploring about magnetic properties of the depositions. The next part or the next layer which will come into picture is inner core. So inner core as the name suggests, it is the innermost part of the earth, earth being spherical, the center part of the earth that is the inner core that is the innermost part of the earth, it is extending from 5100 kilometer depth to 6400 kilometer depth. So starting from the base of the outer core which is ending at 5100 kilometer depth and reaching up to a depth of 6400 kilometer that means reaching at the center of the earth. That is the radius of the inner core and this is a solid ball mostly composed of iron having a thickness of uh, having a temperature of 5000 to 7000 degree centigrade. 
even though the temperature is very high in inner core because of overburden pressure of the layers that is outer core, lower mantle, upper mantle crust, the material which is available in the inner core still remains in solid form. In the outer core if you look at the material, the material was available in liquid form. Now the classification based on physical properties. So, so far we have discussed about the, about the classification based on the composition of the different layer which is available beneath the ground surface starting from the crust. Then we have upper mantle, lower mantle, outer core, inner core. If we discuss or classify the earth in terms of physical properties, we will see five layers that is the first one is lithosphere. It is consist of rigid outer layer of the earth including the crust as well as upper mantle. The thickness of lithosphere varies from as low as 10 kilometer in oceanic region to as high as 300 km in terms of continental regions. Primarily this is because of the inclusion of upper mantle. Similarly, if you discuss about asthenosphere, these consist of soft rocks in molten state which can be deformed easily. The chemical composition of asthenosphere is same as that of lithosphere, but there is slight modification in terms of mechanical properties. The third layer which will be encountered is mesosphere. At this particular great depth, the higher pressure effect dominates the effect of higher temperature and thus again you will encounter that the material are stronger as well as more rigid in terms of mesosphere. So, basically it is the zone between asthenosphere that is located consisting of primarily the molten material and the core. Again, in terms of physical properties also because the outer core is located in liquid form and the inner core is available in solid form. So, the last layer that is core in terms of physical properties also you can divide it into outer core as well as inner core. So, ground surface it is basically consisting of solid material then you are having liquid material in upper mantle as well as in lower mantle with different uh, uh, driving phenomena and then you are having outer core that is again molten state having temperature in the range of 4000 to 5000 degree centigrade. Then you will encounter another core part of the core that is inner core which is solid of iron and it is continuously under rotation. Now here in this particular picture we will come to know about different layers. So, you can see over here where there is Africa, there is Eurasia, there is South America, you are actually able to see the continental crust. At the same time, we are having different different oceans also where you are able to see the oceanic crust also. Then you start moving from the crust, then you will encounter the upper mantle and then within the upper mantle across the globe you can experience Philippine Trench, Mariana Trench, Mid-Oceanic Ridge, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. These are kind of some governing uh, dominating um, regions where whatever is happening between the crust and the mantle can be visually identified. Again you start from surface. So, after the upper mantle there will be lower mantle as can be seen over here. There is significant variation in terms of temperature between lower mantle as well as the, the top of lower mantle as well as the bottom of this lower layer, uh, mantle layer. As a result of this particular variation in the temperature between the top and the bottom of the same layer, there will be generation of convection current. So, what happens? The material which is close to the surface or close to the top layer of a particular layer the material is, is relatively in cooler state because near the surface the temperature is relatively low. As a result the material becomes heavier, it will start sinking. When it is moving downward or sinking within or start moving towards the bottom, the material will experience increase in temperature. When the material will experience increase in temperature, the material will expand. As a result there will be reduction in the density of the material. So, that the material when, which at one moment was going down 
with increase in temperature and reduction in the density, the matter will also start coming onto the surface. Once it comes to the surface, again there will be solidification in the material or reduction in the volume or increase in the density, matter will start again sinking because there is as you reach to the near the surface, there is reduction in the temperature, the material is getting cooler. So, material is getting cooler, it is coming onto the surface, becoming heavier, it starts sinking. As it is sinking, the material will expand, reduction in the density, material becomes lighter and then it will start moving towards the surface. So, the process of solidification, cooling, expansion, heating that keeps on happening, it is a continuous process as a result of which there is a continuous current which is developed in the material which are primarily located in its molten state or it in liquid form. So, same can be witnessed in lower mantle, in upper mantle also, in outer core also and definitely not in inner core because that is a solid material. So, the convection current which is generated in different different layers that is outer mantle, upper mantle, lower mantle, outer core, each of these because there is the material is primarily in liquid state and there is significant variation in the temperature between the top of that particular layer and the bottom of that particular layer, the generation of convection current is a continuous process. As a result of this convection current, the material which is in contact with the layer above that particular layer in which the convection current has been generated, what will happen? This layer or the material which is undergoing rotation, the, the material which is at the bottom most portion of the upper layer, that means if you are talking about upper mantle, so the material in upper mantle which is undergoing convection current, it will basically induce kind of push into the bottom of the crust as a result of which this particular layer start moving. So, there was a crust and because of convection current generated in the mantle, it started pushing the material because this particular material is also quite rough and then this particular convection current which is also developed in a particular material which is undergoing continuous motion as a result of which the crust is started moving. Now, depending upon the direction, depending upon the dominating forces which are controlling the continent, the convection current at a particular location that will define whether the, the, the land mass, a particular land mass will be moving towards adjacent land mass or it will be moving away from the adjacent land mass. So, this uh, the primarily the variation in the temperature and expansion and solidification in the material subsequently is responsible for the development of convection current. If we talk about the magnetic field of the earth, you can see over here that in outer core as well, there is development of convection current as a result of which when the material which is metallic in nature, when it start moving there will be development of magnetic field which we can witness at the surface by means of magnetic needle which is orienting towards magnetic north and magnetic south. So, depending upon the rotation of inner core with respect to the outer core that can define the configuration of magnetic north and magnetic south pole which as per existing information there is shuffling of magnetic poles also possible. Now, when we discuss in terms of uh, continent, uh, convection current, the primary objective was to find out what are the driving forces from where these driving forces are generated such that these forces are basically pushing the top surface of the earth. So, this is the reason the continental drift theory, it was a theory. So, so starting from different uh, researchers, Ortelius, Christoph. Uh, Leanthan, Alexander von Humboldt and many more propose that the land mass on which we are staying, it is not basically fixed at a particular location, but is under constant motion. Primarily reason was the exact matching of coastal lines of two land masses which are in current configuration 1000 miles apart. In the year 1915, Alfred Wagner 
a German geologist. He proposed the theory of continental drift, suggesting because of exact matching of coastal lines between land masses which in current configuration are far away from each other. Because of this exact matching, he proposed that the land masses are in continuous motion. So, somewhere in the past, these all the land masses might be in close proximity with respect to each other and because of convection current, which is not the part of continental drift theory, the land masses started moving away from each other. Please note here that continental drift theory only tells that land masses are moving away from each other or there is relative motion between the land masses. It never tells the reason of such movement. It completely explains that motion is happening. It also tells that entire land mass almost 250 million years ago was a single continent called as Pangaea and then later on it started broken into pieces and then started moving. So, if you see these three pictures which are shown at the bottom, you can see what was the configuration almost 270 million years ago. Then uh, almost 150 million years ago. So, you can see with respect to 270 million years ago, some land masses had started moving. Again, the third part or the figure C will tell you the configuration almost 1 million year ago. So, you can see here whatever land masses in first picture of picture A were together, they started moving and then you can see there is significant movement starting from 270 years to 1 million years ago. The movement Depending upon the governing uh, factors, the movement can be of the order of 2 millimeter per year, 3 millimeter per year. So, the process is happening very slowly and it is continuously happening for millions of years. Now, when we say the continents are moving, certain evidences are also there which also supports that the theory which was suggested by Alfred Wegener in 1950 is, is actually supported by the physical uh, evidences. Some of the uh, evidences include similar animal and plant fossils on land masses which are not adjacent to each other at least in the current configuration. So, you can see on this particular picture the western part of Africa and southern part of and the eastern part of South America you can see the coastal line is approximately matching or it is fitting into each other. Similarly, the uh, southwestern part of India and then eastern part of Africa, the continental uh, the, the coastal lines are matching, same configuration you can see with respect to India and Antarctica and then Antarctica as well as Australia. So, it is not only in terms of exact matching of the coastal lines, but at the same time plants and animal fossils which were located sometimes or found in uh, uh, eastern part of South America are matching exactly with the western part of Africa. So, if you see in the current configuration Africa or South America that will be thousands of millions apart, but in support in support of that the, the, the coastal lines are exactly matching as well as the fossils of animals and plants which are located or which are found in South America are also matching with Africa that suggested like in the past these two land masses and similarly similar observation we can also see from other land masses were in close proximity with respect to each other which was suggested in the previous slide as Pangaea. So, matching of coastal lines similar uh, animals and plant fossil which, which are found in different parts of closely matching coastal lines across the globe. Second third one is distribution of glacial sediment. So, the characteristics of sediments which are found in different different uh, parts of the globe in different different continents, the distribution of glacial sediment also follows some similarity. The last part is similarity in magnetic anomalies. So, as we discussed whenever the magnetic material is undergoing solidification, the material from deeper layer comes onto the surface by means of volcanic eruptions and at the time of deposition and solidification the magnetic minerals will orient themselves with respect to magnetic north and south pole configuration at that particular location and at that, that, that particular time. If that particular material or that particular location is under continuous movement, what we will see after several thousand of years, the material might have moved 
with respect to its initial position of deposition to some other distance. Now, if you see as per the new distance, the configuration of the material and in terms of position as well as in terms of orientation of the mineral with respect to the magnetic north and south, there will be some anomaly. So, it has been observed that because of the magnetic minerals which are available in different different continents, the magnetic anomaly is also finding some kind of similarity. That is also suggested that the magnetic minerals which were deposited in one part of the continent where the continental uh, the coastal boundary is also uh, matching with the adjacent uh, continent, the magnetic anomaly or the characteristics of the magnetic mineral which is not matching with the current configuration, but are matching with respect to each other. So, going ahead with these evidences that, that is similar animal and plant fossil, matching of coastal boundary, distribution of glacial sediments, then similarity in magnetic anomalies, which are found in terms of uh, different uh, continents, which are available across the globe. One observation which collectively comes to the mind is definitely in the past several hundred years, several hundred millions years ago, the land masses which in current configuration are wide apart from each other, but must have been in close proximity with respect to each other. And later on when the, the convection current or the theory of plate tectonics came into picture, we can also understand that what is the governing factor which is responsible for the movement of these land masses, which are spreading maybe thousands of kilometers in length and width and are in under continuous motion even in the current configuration. So, if one is interested to know the, the rate and the direction of movement, often we can refer, refer to GPS based measurements or satellite based measurements and then we can get to know which part of the globe is moving in which direction and at what rate per year. So, as for the continent and the plate tectonics, we can suggest that the earth surface or the, the, the surface of the earth which is consisting of continental as well as oceanic crust, it is basically consisting of large number of intact blocks or plates and these plates by means of convection current keep on moving with respect to each other. In general, we can see seven major plates are there. So, on the figure which is given on the right hand side, we can see so, the entire globe can be divided into seven major plates starting with Eurasian plate, Indo-Australian plate, Pacific plate, North American plate, Eurasian plate, South American plate, African plate. Later on because of development of stresses within the plates also, we can see subsequently 14 and 14 uh, subcontinental size plates. So, above 7 plates and in addition to that you are having also some subcontinental plates like Filipino plate, Cocos plate, Nazca plate, Juan de Fuca plate, Arabia plate, Scotia plate, Caribbean plate. So, in total you are having 17 major plates and 14 subcontinental plates in which the entire globe or the surface of the earth can be divided into each of these plate. Now, the arrow shown here are showing you the relative motion of these plates. So, if you see India Australian plate, one side it is moving towards northeast. If you go to the southern part of Indo Australian plate, it is moving primarily in the northern direction. So, this movement is basically governed by the, the convection current in the subsurface, uh, the layers below the continent and the crust. And similarly, in other parts like South American plate, you can see it is moving towards the west, North American move plate is moving towards northwest, Eurasian plate is moving towards uh, southeast and subsequently in different parts of the globe, you can see there is relative movement, not all the plates are moving towards each other, but in different different directions. That gives a confidence that these plates were in contact with each other and then whenever two plates are coming in contact e with each other, that possibility also is there. Now, we have seen that there are different plates which are moving away from each other towards each other. So, these plates where the places where the two plates are coming in contact with each other, such locations are called as plate boundaries. So, you are having one plate, 
may be Eurasian plate, you are having other plate like Indo American, Australian plate, and wherever these two plates are coming in contact with each other, those locations are called as plate boundaries. So, this is one plate, this is another plate, these two plates are coming in contact with each other, and then this boundary, which is the interference medium between the two plates, this particular medium is called as boundaries or plate boundaries. Now, depending upon whether the two plates are moving towards each other or when the two plates are moving away from each other or where, where there is slight pass or relative motion between the two plates, these plate boundaries can be categorized into three categories that is divergent plate boundary. As the name suggests means divergent means the two plates are diverging away from each other. Second one is convergent plate boundary as the name suggests that the two plates are not moving away from each other, but rather they are converging or moving towards each other. So, in divergent plate boundary, the plates are moving away from each other. In convergent plate boundary, the two plates are moving away towards each other. Then, not every time across the globe, you will see that the plates are either moving towards each other or away from each other, but there might be positions in order to understand or to maintain the rate of divergence or convergence, different rate of divergence and convergence, there might be some locations which will experience a form of pure shear. So, two plates are there, if you see in plan the two plates are moving not towards each other or away from each other, but there is relative motion between these two plates. So, this is the movement in plan, the two plates are moving away from each other. So, at the boundary you will see a form of pure shear and such boundaries are called as transform plate boundary. So, you are having divergent boundary moving away from each other, convergent boundary moving towards each other, transform plate boundary where there is slight past or relative motion in plan. So, divergent plate boundary as the name suggests, you can see because the two plates are moving away from each other, it creates a space through which the material from deeper layers. So, so this is divergent plate boundary when the two plates are moving away from each other it will create a space through which the material which is available at deeper layer will come onto the surface and will start depositing. Now, here when the material comes onto the surface and start depositing that means, when the two plate moved with respect to each other, some other material from the deeper depth came and started depositing here. So, you will end up in creating new land masses in case of divergent plate boundary. That is why divergent plate boundaries are also called as constructive boundary, you are constructing basically new landmass. It is also called as extensional boundary because the two plates are extending away from each other. So, you can call it as divergent or extensional or constructive plate boundaries. In divergent plate boundary, when you are discussing, you will mostly see the two plates are moving away from each other. Most common at oceanic plate boundaries. So, two oceanic plates are there which are moving away from each other as a result of which you can see the new land mass continuously is getting created or the molten material is coming onto the surface from the deeper layers and getting solidifies. Critical example of divergent plate boundary primarily for oceanic crust is oceanic ridge. This allows the flow of material from the bottom or from the mantle onto the surface through the rifts or valleys. Now, when the material, so the two boundaries or the two plates were moving away from each other, the material through rifts or valleys came onto the surface, started depositing over here and this plate is moving. So, you will see this was the boundary and this is the plate which is continuously moving. So, material from the bottom when it comes to the surface, it gets solidifies and it is under continuous motion. So, you will see the material which is deposited now after maybe several hundreds of years, you will see slightly the material has moved away from the divergent plate boundary and then at this particular place, there will be new material which is getting deposited. So, based on that analogy, we can see the material which is deposited very close to divergent plate boundary will be relatively younger because it has been deposited in recent time with respect to another material which was also deposited at the plate boundary, same plate boundary, but several hundreds of years back, because that material might have reached far off from the divergent plate boundary. So, the material which is close to divergent plate boundaries 
relatively younger material which is away from the plate boundary is relatively older because this particular divergent plate is in continuous motion so this allows the flow of material from the mantle to the surface rocks which are close to the divergent boundaries are relatively younger in comparison to the rocks which are away from the divergent plate boundary usually divergent plate boundary are responsible for shallow focus earthquake what is shallow focus earthquake we will discuss in coming slides and generally uh, such shallow focus earthquake are of low magnitude also some more example of divergent plate boundary mid ocean mid atlantic ridge pacific and antarctica ridge red sea ridge so each of these are giving example of ridge where the two plates which are moving away from each other because of the ridge the material is coming on to the surface and getting solidified they result in the formation of new land mass that is why this is called as constructive plate boundary or extensional plate boundary the next one is convergent plate boundary as the name suggests that means either the two plates are moving from each other towards each other or even one plate is moving under the other plate this is called as convergent plate boundary that means there is no movement away from each other but whatever movement is happening at the plate boundary it is towards each other that's why this boundary is also called as destructive boundary so if you see there are two plates which are moving away from each uh, towards each other when these two collide this particular land mass actually it is going under this particular layer because if they are striking one has to consume and one has to maintain so that's why this is called as because it's undergoing consumption when we were discussing about divergent plate boundary new land mass was creating so you call it as constructive in convergent boundary because one land mass is continuously moving under the other boundary you call it as destructive plate boundary so convergent plate boundaries are also called as destructive plate boundaries usually such boundaries are called when the two tectonic plates are moving towards each other and collision takes place usually the younger and softer material or the layer which is the plate boundary which is relatively softer that will bend and start subducting under the older and relatively stiffer material so you can see over here the material two plate boundaries are there whatever boundary is relatively younger and softer that will uh, at the time of collision will start bending or subducting under the older plate and it is going down so you can see over here the younger plate is actually undergoing some kind of destruction or the land mass of younger plate is actually getting consumed at the convergent plate boundary as a result of higher pressure friction now this material which which started moving towards the uh, under the uh, the older plate this material when start moving down it will also be subjected to high pressure as well as temperature as a result of which many times the material will undergo melting at the convergent plate boundary now depending upon what are the two plates whether one plate is ocean one plate is continent then you call it as continent ocean convergent plate boundary when two plates are when two plates moving at the uh, convergent plate boundary are both are oceanic plate then you call it as ocean ocean convergent boundary or oceanic oceanic convergence uh, critical example is the himalaya uh, uh, the mid oceanic ridge when continent and oceanic convergence is there then you call it as continent oceanic convergence example is western coast of south america then continent and continent are converging critical example is the himalayas and the south alps so the two plates are moving towards each other the younger plate is subducting under the older or relatively stiffer medium and and when the material reaches to certain depth you will experience that the material is undergoing melting that is why the the convergent plate boundaries are also called as destructive plate boundaries so here are some of the pictorial views of oceanic oceanic convergence so in first one you can see uh, one ocean is subducting under the other ocean definitely an example of convergence plate boundary and when the material undergoes or subducts under the other plate there will be friction there will be melting of the material and sometime this molten material will come on to the surface through volcanic eruption 
So, you can also see some kind of volcanoes, continuous chain of volcanoes or continuous chain of mountains at the convergent boundaries. So, when oceanic oceanic crust are undergoing convergence, you can see over here the first figure, it is basically showing you some kind of volcanic eruption and the molten material from the bottom is coming onto the surface. Second one continent ocean uh, convergence. So, continental crust is there and oceanic crust is there. Oceanic crust is bending under the continental crust as a result of which again there will be friction, there will be melting of the material. When this molten material comes onto the surface, you can again experience some kind of volcanic eruption. Because in second case, the volcanic eruption is happening at the surface, it will be more evidence or you can clearly witness it. In the first one, when the uh, volcanic eruption is happening beneath the uh, or under the ocean, so everything will be submerged within water and then that is how it will be uh, happening. The third one is continent continental convergence. So, here you, you can see there is no ocean, only both sides land masses are there. So, while one side the land mass will go down and will start men, uh, uh, melting, the other side the land mass initially when these two came in contact, then slightly the, the younger material start bending down, the other material will experience some kind of rise and then over the period of time when this process of convergence between two continental plate boundaries continues for millions of years, you will see continuous chain of mountains, critical example is the Himalayas and the South Alps. So, these two are critical examples of convergent plate boundary when the two continental plates are converging towards each other. The next one or the last one kind of plate boundary as we discussed. So, one side when we are having convergent plate boundary, somewhere there will be divergent plate boundary. So, consider two uh, plates which are away from each other, but are converging or diverging at different different rates. So, certainly there might be some locations where there is in order to balance this particular difference in the rates of divergence or convergence, there will be some zones which are undergoing pure shear. So, this particular pure shear is critical example of transform plate boundary. There is no consumption of the material because none of the plates are moving or subducting under the other plate. There is no construction of the new land mass because the two plates are not moving away from each other in order to bring the material from bottom onto the surface. So, neither it is constructing nor it is destructing. That is why this kind of plate boundaries that is transform plate boundaries are also called as con conservative conserve plate boundary. So, these generally transport strain between the ridges or subduction zones as, as I told when two uh, plate boundaries are there with different rate of convergence or divergence certainly in between there will be a transform plate boundary connects these abruptly ending ridges to other faults or ridges. Critical example here is mid oceanic ridge. So, summarizing whatever we have discussed in today's class is though we have some information about earth based on whatever we are seeing in and around of ourselves, but as you start exploring the overall characteristics whether in terms of mass, whether in terms of volume, it gives indirect hint of there is something more denser, there is something which is denser and in addition consisting of larger volume is existing beneath the ground surface. Then based on that we found out that overall in terms of composition three layers are there, crust, mantle and core. In terms of physical properties also five layers are there. Then we saw because of significant variation in the temperature as well as uh, overburden pressure, some layers are in solid state, some layers are in liquid state. Further we saw because of significant variation in the temperature between the top and bottom of same layer, there will be development of convection current. This convection current particularly in the upper mantle will result in push of the crust or that is how you can see different land masses which are available across the globe are in continuous motion with respect to each other. Theory of continental drift suggested that the land masses were move in are in continuous motion with respect to each other. Plate tectonics suggested that these land masses are by means of convection current are actually in constant motion with respect to each other. Then we saw when these land masses are in motion with respect to each other, 
depending upon whether the two land masses are moving away each from each other towards each other or pure shear you can have divergent convergent or transform plate boundary so next class we will continue more about what is happening beneath the ground surface and how it is contributing to earthquake occurrence and subsequently we will discuss more about the topic. Thank you everyone. Thank you.